Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's event, Cancer and Immunotherapy, Greatest Challenges and Novel Therapies Inspiring European Citizens. Today's event, as you know, is organized by the Federation of European Academies for Medicine's European Biomedical Policy Forum with the support of Cancer Research UK. Um, I'm going to hand over now to George Griffin, who is president of the Federation of European Academies of Medicine, and Pam Kearns, who is the senior clinical advisor of Cancer Research UK, um, to open our session today. So, George, the floor is yours. Thank you, Catherine. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this really, really important lecture this morning. Uh, FIAM is a group of uh, 22 European academies of medicine, veterinary science, and uh, pharmacy and pharmacology. And I must say today is a great example of how we, between the various countries and academies and scientific groups in Europe, we can get together. Uh, even though it's on Zoom, uh, we can get together to talk about these very, very important uh, issues. Uh, we have a forum in FEM, which is a, a mix of uh, patient groups, of um, uh, industry, of academe, uh, that meets three times a year. And we look on this as one of our most important uh, events in FIM, and we have a science policy meeting as well. And this meeting is a, is, is a mixture of those two. We have a very distinguished speaker today who's uh, both a friend of mine uh, professionally and, and as a colleague, and uh, I'm delighted that we'll be hearing from uh, Pierre soon. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to hand over to um, uh, Pamela Cairns, Professor Pamela Cairns, who is uh, an expert oncologist, who is uh, the director of Cancer Research UK, who is jointly sponsoring this meeting. So Pamela, if you'd like to uh, uh, say a few words, and then uh, Catherine will hand over to, uh, 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 to uh, Pierre. And welcome everyone once again. I'm delighted that you've all taken the time to, to come. Thank you, George. Thank you. And, and thank you to, to everybody who's uh, dialed into this call. Um, on behalf of Cancer Research UK, um, we are really honoured to be working with FIAM to uh, bring this particular really eminent lecture to you today. Um, Cancer Research UK is uh, a really one of the largest funders of cancer research in the UK. It funds around half of all publicly funded cancer research within the UK, extending from fundamental research through drug development and clinical trials, as well as cancer prevention and screening. And the impact of research in immunotherapy and immunotherapeutic approaches to cancer has be, really been a step change in the way we look at cancer treatments. And so this is a fantastic opportunity to not only hear the, the front line or from an excellent lecture, but then have the opportunity for, to really debate the issues. We're in a really unusual uh, world at the moment with COVID-19 and how that's going to impact on both research and how we conduct clinical trials in the future. Um, so I think this is timely and we have a fantastic panel with really uh, diverse perspectives on, on how um, immunotherapy is evolving and the impact of our current uh, COVID-19 world. So I do not want to stand between you and this, these exciting lectures. So um, just again, thank you very much to FIAM, to all of you for, di for dialing into this call. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Catherine, uh, who's going to moderate our meeting. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pam, and thank you, George. Um, before we get started, I'm maybe going to say that there's a slight change to today's program. So we will have Professor Ricciardi speaking at um, speaking now, and then Pierre Cooley, and then our high-level panel will start after that. Um, so now, turning to Professor Walter Ricciardi, who is the Professor of Hygiene and Public Health at the Università Cattolica di Sacro Cuore, Rome, and the Chair of the Cancer Mission at the European Commission. So the goal of this mission is obviously very ambitious. It's to save 3 million lives from cancer by 2030. And um, so per Professor Ricciardi, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. What shape is that challenge going to take? Yeah, it's a pleasure for me to give you an update because we just received uh, two days ago a letter for 
from President von der Leyen, uh, under, underlining at the different approach that the European Commission is taking uh, as concerning the mission. You know that the mission boards uh, and the missions are a different approach in relation to the past. Horizon 2020 was a major success, but unfortunately, no citizens in the middle of the road in any city in Europe uh, had heard of it. So essentially the impact on the awareness of uh, this uh, very important effort uh, was uh, practically unknown to citizens. So the missions want to give directions to European research and innovation in solving society's pressing challenges and producing tangible results and particularly to involve citizens and stakeholders more closely in setting research priorities and essentially in co-planning, co-managing, co-evaluating uh, the mission. Uh, the five missions were related to the five challenges that uh, human life has on this planet. So uh, it's the climate change and sustainability, it's water and, uh, and fishes and fisheries and uh, food and agriculture, smart cities and cancer. Cancer, because uh, I mean, you know, it's one of, uh, of the major societal challenges in Europe. The number of uh, the burden of disease is currently uh, the highest in the world, with 10% of the population. Uh, Europe has 25% of cancer. And if we don't act now, in 2035, it will have 50% of the burden of disease. So this will increase by 25%. And Europe needs better equitable prevention and diagnosis, treatments and care, survival rates and quality of life. We, we, we have uh, uh, worked hard in, in the group and we have produced a report that has been handed over to uh, the commission in September together with the reports of the other four. And uh, I must say that uh, the impact of this report has been so strong that the commission has likely changed. So it's not only going to only to be a research and innovation, it's going to be the strategic basis uh, for the, uh, the agenda of the union in the next years. Uh, we have just received a, 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 an official communication by President von der Leyen that this is going to shape uh, the future of the Union. So essentially it's going to be in the activities of the missions and for that and there will be a conference on the future of Europe so that will uh, uh, be uh, started at the beginning of 2021 in uh, which uh, the European Commission together with the European Parliament and the Council will have a joint declaration on the scope, objective and structure of the conference so that this can be launched swiftly taking into account the latest evolution, of course, of the pandemic, but having in mind that these five challenges are of paramount importance for the future of uh, uh, European uh, citizens, and I would say of the world. Well, when it comes to the uh, mission and to our report, as, uh, as you have said, we have analyzed the evidence and leading uh, to the conclusion that by 2030, we can save more than 3 million lives and we can make people living longer and better by five intervention areas. Two are horizontal cross cuttings and three are vertical pillars of the actions. The two horizontal areas are understanding and this is research. Research means uh, research, basic and fundamental research, clinical research, translational research, implementation research, health service and the system research. And this is going to be uh, funded via different uh, uh, tools. Uh, the first of, of them will be the launching of a European initiative to understand cancer. It will be called uncan.eu and will develop a EU-wide research program to identify the several aspects that can help us to understand why something is uh, going in that direction, why some cancers are not druggable, why do we have some problems in managing the disease. And research will be, of course, also the basis for advancing and implementing the personalized medicine approach for all cancer patients in Europe so to develop the EU-wide research program on early diagnostic and minimal invasive treatment technologies to develop a EU-wide research program and policy support to improve the quality of life of cancer patients and survivors, family members and carers, and all persons with an increased uh, uh, risk of cancer. And in fact, the three vertical pillars are the prevention, so preventing all that is preventable, 
You know that 40% of cancer are prevented via modification of lifestyles, but unfortunately people don't change their, their lifestyles. And the, we have to understand why, and we have to make cancer a social responsibility, not only an individual responsibility. I mean, if people eat too much and junk food, don't practice physical activity, smoke tobacco and drink too much alcohol, of course, it's not blaming them that we find a solution to the, this problem, but we have to help government to find the most appropriate way to support the most appropriate choice by citizen. And then, of course, optimization of diagnostic and treatment will be a second pillar, and the third will be supporting the quality of life. One of the most important emphasis of the mission board and of the mission board report is the concept of equity. So we want that every single European citizen will be approaching the best possible access to care, which is not happening now. And to do that and to facilitate that, we will create a European Cancer Patient Digital Center where cancer patients and survivors can deposit and share their data for personalized care. In other words, we give for granted that the future of our care will be based on the digital transformation of our care. And we are going to fund and support uh, countries, member states, but also single organizations in Europe to do that. And also we will be supporting the setting up of a network of comprehensive cancer infrastructures because we know that where research is carried out, uh, patients are taken care of better. And the problem is that not in all EU member states this is happening, and there are uh, also in within member states a difference in treating patients uh, according to geographical areas and to socioeconomic group. Uh, and another very important funding that we will do on research is to develop a EU-wide research program to identify polygenic risk scores. Uh, you know that this is happening. Uh, the richer countries are funding it. We want to this. Uh, happening for all, even for the smaller member states. So, so we are going to support the, this, the full genome sequencing of 5,000 citizens in all European member states. And this is going to happen for even the smallest and uh, the poorest country in Europe, so that everybody is accessing this kind of approach and possibly in future to predict cancer many, 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 many years before the onset of the disease. Mm -hmm. Another very important, and I'm going to the conclusion, are three uh, uh, actions that are somehow cross-cutting actions. The first is childhood cancer and cancers in young uh, uh, adults. To cure more and cure better, these uh, this patients means to approach them in a very specific way with all the problems and the specificity of these age groups. And uh, uh, important action is to supporting the funding and the acceleration of innovation and implementation of new technologies with the development of public-private initiatives and creating oncology-focused living labs uh, to conquer cancer. And last but not least, uh, transform cancer culture, communication, and capacity building. We were very happy that together with the other four mission boards, you can imagine the interactions with the food, we, you can imagine the interaction with the environment because 20% actually of cancer are somehow related to environmental pollution and other occupational hazards. Uh, this is something which is happening now in Europe. And I believe that only in Europe can happen this because we share common values. We share the concept of universal coverage as a prerequisite for granting these values. We privilege uh, and the uh, basis of the European Union the basis of solidarity. And I think that this is something that is going to be done in the next seven years. As JFK, you know, the mission concept has been inspired to the famous speech that John Fitzgerald Kennedy gave to the Rice University concerning the mission to the moon. Uh, when the uh, United States were in trouble, he thought to give a message to all US citizens that they were going to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard not because it's uh, easy, but because it's needed, not because it's easy, but because it's something very important for the whole countries. And we believe that this challenge is very important for all Europeans. And by chance, after seven years, they went to the moon. And this is our hope that in seven years, or maybe a little bit more, we are going to conquer cancer, which we believe is mission possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Professor Ricciardi, maybe I can just um, ask you some some questions, if you don't mind, about this. Sure. Um, you had mentioned that the pillars will be prevention, diagnostics, quality of life. So it's it's quite a well-rounded um, proposal. Um, in terms of prevention, you had mentioned that kind of maybe focusing more on 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 governmental, on legislation, policy making, rather than the individual. Could you no, just no. Expand? We, we no? do both. Sorry. We do both. If you look at the report, uh, we have recommended thirteen bold actions, and each of them with specific uh, thirteen recommendations. Each of these uh, thirteen recommendations has a set of actions with uh, uh, resources allocated in key performance indicator. When it comes to prevention, we do both. We want to do both. So essentially what is called primordial prevention, you know, which is uh, something that is related with policies, but also primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. And uh, uh, our proposal is to fund them both. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you had also mentioned this uh, genome sequencing um, that will be rolled out across across all of Europe. Yeah. Um, this is very cool. Um, this will predict cancer, you think, for the future. Yeah, we have had a lot of discussion, of course, the, the level of uh, uh, awareness of this is very, very heterogeneous in Europe. So there are some who are skeptics, some who are confident that this can happen anyway this is going to happen anyhow so we believe that this the european added value of funding this for all member states is very important and uh, we hope that this is going to give some concrete results in in a, in a short term mm -hmm. okay and then what are the next set steps that we can expect in terms of the cancer mission given the fact that the commission has attributed such an important uh, uh, role to the missions uh, for the future. So the Commission want to be sure that the government, the governance and the implementation is very well cared. So there will be a, 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 a long period of preparation, a longer period of preparation, rather than a quick start of implementation. So rather, certainly the program will officially be started on January the 1st, but uh, they will, we have been asked to stay one year longer in order to support the European uh, Commission in accordance with the European Parliament and Member States to prepare the appropriate governance for this. So we will stay a little bit longer in order to make this uh, uh, very well enforced, you know, and uh, you may understand that this is very complex, it's very complex, and it's also based on a mix of, uh, of tools. Uh, we are discussing which are the most appropriate tools to fund research, to support policy, to develop collaboration. And that's why the commission has asked the mission, the five mission boards to stay a little bit longer in support them for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Ricciardi. We appreciate you being here today. Um, are there any questions for Professor Ricciardi before he leaves? Um, no, okay. So thank you very much. Um, You're very and welcome, bye-bye. Bye, bye-bye. <laughs> Um, okay, I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker, keynote speaker for today, who is Pierre Cooley. Pierre is a professor at the Duvet Institute at UCL in Brussels, and he is the past president of the Belgian Royal Academy of Medicine. He is an expert on the antigenicity and the immunogenicity of human tumors, and his current research deals with the immunogenicity of breast carcinomas. Um, as a short reminder, you can send questions to us to us through the Q&A function throughout this event, and we will answer them later during the Q&A session. So Pierre, thank you very much for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we will go. Fine. Do you see that? Is that okay for you? Yes. Okay, good. So what is uh, cancer immunotherapy? Let's start with the definition. So it's using the capabilities of our immune system to reject tumors if they are there or prevent their recurrence or metastasis, of course. So it's a quite old dream by uh, immunologists, but it's fairly recent, barely 10 years ago that there were real uh, successes in, in, in patients. Uh, nevertheless, even though there are fantastic clinical results for some patients, we still do not really understand completely what is going on, even when it is uh, efficacious, uh, and even less why it does not work in most patients. I will explain that later. 
So there is clearly much, much room for improvement and uh, we will uh, touch on that at the end of the uh, lecture. So let's start with these uh, capabilities of our immune system. What are we talking about? Well, it's reasonably clear now that the main effectors of our immune system to destroy uh, cancer cells are the cytolytic T lymphocytes. So part of our uh, white blood cells, of course. And you see them here. So within a few dozens of minutes, uh, the target cells will undergo apoptosis in the cytolytic T cell can be recycled in a way and can lie uh, other targets. This is happening with exquisite specificity. This is a key uh, element in, in there. We'll come back to that. And there is memory in this system because these lymphocytes will proliferate and their progeny will be maintained in your body basically forever or, or almost forever. This is another very important concept. Now, there are, of course, other immune cells that can play a role in that process or even kill tumor cells themselves. And they are listed here below. Uh, so I do not mean by mentioning cyclic T cells that they are the only actors far from there. But thus far, they are clearly the main ones and the main targets of uh, drugs in immunotherapy today. The cytolytic T cells, which are tumor specific or can be tumor specific, they recognize a reasonably wide array of what we call antigens, so targets. The, the, the groups of these antigens are listed here. We'll not go into details. You see that each time we have a precise genetic mechanism that is behind the specificity. It's of course key to have cytolytic T cells that can recognize and kill your tumor cells, but not your normal cells. Otherwise, you ending up with autoimmune disease together with uh, treating your cancer. So we do not want that, of course. And the simple notion that this could exist uh, was doubtful for has been doubtful for many many decades. And an important notion here is that some of these uh, tumor antigens, as they are called, are really uh, highly specific for the tumor cells, or for some of them, uh, the, one, the ones on the left here, completely specific for the tumor cells, while others uh, are not completely specific. And later I will mention antigens on B cells, CD19 for CAR T cells. And they are actually differentiation antigens, not really tumor specific antigens. So the conclusions of all this work, by the way, all this work was carried out mostly in Europe. Of course, it does not make much sense. Uh, after America first, we do not need Europe first. But it's a fact that many of these discoveries were, discoveries were, uh, were uh, done in, in Europe, uh, as a matter of fact. And the conclusion is that human tumors uh, are antigenic. And I have a small translation for those of, those of you who are not familiar with immunology jargon uh, to autologous to our own T cells. That in many instances, these antigens can be completely tumor specific. And this is very important for the safety of the procedures that we are, we are going to talk about. And it was also, also quite clear uh, from the beginning, uh, or almost from the beginning, that in many cancer patients, we can detect these T cells uh, in blood or in tumors. And this is also a very important notion, and I will come back to that uh, later. Because if you admit that some T cells uh, are working against your tumor, if you are unhappy enough to, to have that, well, then it means that at a later stage, the tumor will, of course, be modified because the tumor cells that are killed, they will disappear. And what will be left will be tumor cells that are not killed, that resist. So probably we have here a treatment that we apply on tumors that actually have, for most of them, already acquired resistance mechanism. This is different that, than for, for other anti-cancer treatment. If you give chemo to a cancer patient for the first time, you do not expect many of these tumor cells to resist uh, primarily. Uh, well, it happens, of course, but uh, 
in most in most cases this is this is not so here it might be uh, different nevertheless because these t cells can be completely specific and because there is memory in the system what you can end up with and this is indeed what is happening i will show you but that was the dream it was to have something that is completely unique to treat patients meaning you have a long lasting and tumor specific uh, activity and what is important there is to realize that with the other treatments you do not have that because when you stop the other treatments well the anti-tumoral activity stops with the treatment here it does not it continues this is immunological memory another notion or immunological concept that will be used in the treatments uh, that are uh, being used today in the clinics is this so if you activate t cells uh, they have a receptor that will recognize what we have mentioned so the these famous antigens but it's not it's not as simple as that because you have an array of core receptors on the left they are stimulatory core receptors and I will mention later CD28. And on the right, they are inhibitory core receptors. So they are modulating the T cell response. Uh, the importance of that is in many different situations, but it's a fine tuning of the T cell response. What is mandatory is always the presence of the antigen that is recognized. This specific recognition has always to be there but the system is tuned by these core receptors. What can be done now, and most of the immunotherapy, cancer immunotherapy drugs today are, are antibodies of that type, we can manipulate this system here with agonist antibodies that will increase this activity on the left, or blocking antibodies here that will uh, decrease the inhibition. I will give you now an example of the usage of these core receptors. You see here from left to right, kind of the life of a T lymphocyte. So it exits your thymus, it's naive, meaning it has never seen its antigen. One day it does so uh, by chance, it's, it's, it's a stochastic, stochastic process, uh, curiously enough. It gets activated. It will proliferate a lot. I mean, 20 divisions in two weeks is something possible. So uh, you have a million cells starting from only one. And these cells will patrol throughout your body and recognize the targets, which could be cancer cells for today or virally infected cells for uh, other diseases that are quite popular today. Now, in the real life, it's not as easy as that, of course, as usual, and you need another molecule, which is here called CD28, which is present uh, from start. And when the T cell is activated for the first time, what we call this priming, you absolutely need to have this co-receptor engaged by its ligand, which is present on some cells, but on few cells only, called B7. What is the consequence of this is that only some cells that we therefore call professional antigen presenting cells can do this job of priming T cell responses. So it's not that easy to stimulate your T cells and have, have them uh, proliferate in your body and circulate forever. It, it would be much too dangerous. So this process is tightly controlled and one of the controls is here. And you see that this co-stimulation here uh, increases T cell activation. Now, after a few hours, what happens is that there is another molecule that comes to the cell surface of T cells called CTLA4. It also engages B7, but with a higher affinity than the CD28. And because B7 is there in limiting amounts, while well, CD28 is outcompeted and does not co-stimulate anymore. And you see that the end, the net result is a decreased T cell activation after a few hours. So this is perfectly, perfectly normal. It's part of our physiology. Is that important? Well, yes, because if you do not have CTLA4, mice or rare patients, 
you end up with dramatic uh, lymphoproliferation and autoimmune uh, diseases. And mice die after a few, a few weeks after, after birth. So this thing is very important. Now, when, what that, what, when this was discovered or became clear, people reasoned that if we could block CTLA4 with antibodies, well, you would prevent this inhibition and T cell stimulation will, would go on at a high level for much longer periods. And uh, Jim Allison, uh, who got the Nobel Prize, thought that this could be used in cancer patients. And many people said, are you crazy? What you will do is induce autoimmune diseases, dramatic autoimmune disease in these patients. It will never work, but it did, as a matter of fact, as you might know, we'll come back to that. At a later stage of uh, T cell life, if you wish, when they are patrolling in your body and encountering tumor cells, there is another similar mechanism that is going on, which uses another inhibitory core receptor called PD-1, and its ligand is PD ligand 1. And this one is transducing a negative signal. But the net result is again the same. Initially, you have a strong T cell activation, and after a few hours or one or two days, it slowly goes down. And again, if you do not have that, you end up in uh, problems. And again, you can block this system by acting either on, on the ligand or on the inhibitory receptor itself, and you would maintain stronger T cell activations in the periphery, so in your peripheral organs, meaning not simply thymus and bone marrow, so in your tumors uh, for what we are discussing today. So these are the scientific bases, and it led to uh, treatments, new treatments for cancer patients. So the first and by far the most important today, as you for sure uh, heard of, are these anti-CTLA4 and anti-PD-1 or PDL1 antibodies? They are listed on the right. So this is a systemic immunostimulation of all your T cells. Of course, this is not specific for your anti-tumor T cells. It is for all your T cells. Therefore, there are side effects uh, and toxicities. There is another way to immunostimulate local, locally now, which is a very interesting concept and that is completely different, which uses oncolytic uh, viruses. It's used for melanoma. This is the only uh, product thus far that, that is uh, commercialized. I show you the, the first results. Well, it's not the 2010 paper, but it's a follow-up five years later because, because we have a longer follow-up of 10 years. And you see what happens to these, what happened to these uh, advanced melanoma patients, normally all of them should be died by four to five years uh, with previous treatment, which was chemotherapy that did, did not work. You see that approximately 20% of the patients are still alive 10 years later after this anti-CTLA4 antibody. So for the melanoma oncologist and Bart Nains uh, here can probably confirm, this was a complete miracle. It was completely new and never heard of such an effect. Possibly, uh, it's difficult to prove, but possibly some of these patients might be cured. More, much more recent results. So you see here in the middle, uh, again, it's advanced melanoma blocking PD-1. You see that it gives a better result than CTLA-4 and it's also less toxic. And now people are uh, thinking of using the two antibodies together. It's even better. So 50% pro pro possibly long-term survival for advanced melanoma. So this is a major result for melanoma patients. Now the combo starts to be uh, seriously toxic. Then this launched an enormous effort to try these drugs in every possible cancer. And you see here the overall response rates. Uh, we will not go into the details, but you see that many cancers do respond. Hodgkin is the champion with almost uh, close to 70% responses. I've not said that these are long-term responses. This is another issue. This is overall response. But you see the, the list here and some patients, some cancer and patients uh, do not respond or respond rarely to these, uh, to these treatments. 
So the lessons from, from this is that you can obtain with these drugs durable tumor regressions. Uh, and the, du the durability is, of course, a key concept across many different cancers. Uh, we have to understand that, nevertheless, uh, most patients do not respond. So my, we can discuss that with uh, uh, Bart later, but I understand that probably less than 20% of cancer patients today really have a benefit from these treatments. So it's fantastic, but uh, there is still uh, much to do. And there are toxicities. And of course, these results uh, justified this uh, Nobel Prize for G to Jim Allison for CTLA-4 and uh, Tasuku Honjo for PD-1. It's interesting to see that this is the first time that we fight cancer with drugs that do not touch themselves, the tumor cells. It's completely indirect. Now, to give you a broader view uh, than these uh, uh, checkpoint blockade inhibitors, as they are uh, often, uh, uh, I think, misnamed in the field, what can also be done uh, is to immunize the patients. So as you have seen with the previous drugs, which are widely used now, what they do is that they boost, they increase the activity of the T cells you already have. We think that maybe with CTLA-4 more than with PD-1, there is a possibility to activate new anti-tumor T cells to prime. But it's reasonably clear and more and more so that most of the effects we see is simply boosting what is already there. It indicates or it suggests that when you have nothing, you did not respond at all. Uh, you did not mount any immune response to your cancer, to your tumors. Well, then these drugs will, will do nothing. And it's probably what is happening in a serious proportion of patients. At least that's what I think. So the idea is, OK, but if the patients are not yet immunized spontaneously against their own tumor, well, we'll do that for them. Well, we'll help them to do that by immunizing them. So it can be active or passive, as we will see. So this is the idea of vaccinating against cancer, because in many instances, we know what are the antigens that are on the surface of the tumor sex. Thus far, this has not worked well. That's the least we can say. And the reason is here. It's very difficult with vaccines to induce strong cytolytic T cell responses. Vaccines work beautifully, and we, 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 we hear about that by the day, uh, to produce antibodies against antigens to inject. We can do that fantastically well. But inducing cytolytic T cells to, 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 to antigens on cells, this is much, much more difficult. Viruses do, do, do that beautifully and very efficiently. But it's very difficult to copy what viruses are doing. So we cannot yet do that very well. That's the least we can say today. But this is the only vaccine uh, against cancer that is uh, commercialized. Uh, it is moderately uh, efficacious, but it's out there. Then because of these difficulties of immunizing against uh, antigens uh, recognized by T cells, well, people said, OK, but if this is not easy to do, what we will do is to give them the, the T cells. Uh, we will derive them from the patients, or we will stimulate them, prime them, activate them for the first time in vitro. We will amplify them enormously and inject them back. It has to be autologous T cells, at least for, for, for the for the time being, so from the same patient. So these T cells initially were not modified, so from, from the patient. Now they are more and more genetically modified. And it's interesting to see that uh, gene therapy or ideas about or uh, 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 comments about uh, genetic modification of uh, human cells and gene therapy have changed enormously with these uh, approaches. No, everybody f believes that this is right, uh, a right thing to do, while gene therapy before that was considered as something uh, devilish. So 
I show for you here on the left a normal uh, wild type, not genetically modified T cell. You see it has a receptor for the antigen. And what will be recognized is a peptide. We have not mentioned that uh, yet today coming from a protein that is inside the cell. This is what is happening with tumor cells. So the antigen is not, on the, not completely on the surface, it's inside. And what is on the surface is a very, very small portion of the antigen that is presented on the surface. We do that to take care of viruses and intracellular bacteria. And we can use the same, the same system for uh, tumors. Here, the, the peptide, that you see is coming from a mutated protein in the tumor. So many mutated proteins or genes uh, provide mutant peptides that are on the surface of tumor cells and that can be recognized by our T cells. It's a, it's a large part of anti-tumor T cell immunity. So it's now possible to obtain these T cells and to amplify them and inject them back. It's not commercially available yet though, and there are still large clinical trials ongoing to demonstrate the efficacy of that. On the right, you see something completely different, which is called CAR T cells. And CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. So what is here, it is shown here, is a chimeric receptor, which contains part of an antibody that can bind to an antigen present on the surface of the tumor. Usually it's a protein. And this transducing unit here comes from the T cell uh, receptors and the CD28 molecules. So this is completely artificial, but it provides any T cell. So we don't care about, anymore about the specificities of these T cells. We give them a new additional specificity for a surface protein on the tumor cells. And this will then activate these T cells and they will produce cytokines. And for those that are lytic, they will lyse the, the cell that is there. So the problem for using this in cancer is that there are not that many really tumor specific proteins on the surface of tumor cells. Because if there were, well, we would produce antibodies to that and kill these cells, which we cannot do for, in most, for most of us. So this is used in a very special context. It's quite smart. It is against B cell leukemias or lymphomas. And the antigen that is targeted is called CD19. So this is a B cell specific surface antigen. It's present, except not on, on, on stem cells, and not on the very later stage on, on plasma cells, but the complete B cell lineage will be recognized. And so you take the T cells from the blood of a patient, uh, transduce them with a transgene that encodes this chimeric receptor and inject the cells back. And it's quite efficient because it will destroy, kill all the B cells in the recipient, all the B cells normal and tumoral. So this is not lethal, interestingly enough, provided that you give the patient uh, gamma globulins and then it's okay. It's, it's surprising, but that works quite well. Then of course, you can have the emergence of CD19 negative uh, leukemic cells or lymphoma cells, but this is an, another issue. So you, you see here, the targeted antigen is not really tumor specific, it is lineage specific, it's a differentiation antigen. But so the, 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 many people are trying to find other interesting surface antigens on tumors, which could be targeted by this uh, quite elegant approach. And there are still many progresses that can be done here because we can genetically manipulate the T cells that are injected back. So the sky is the limit, uh, basically. So it's here on the left. There is another approach that uh, reaches approximately the same results uh, in a simpler way. And it is shown here on the right. And we will zoom on here the recognition uh, area. You see that again here we have T cells 
that have any specificity, we will not use the specificity of their T cell receptor, which is the same as for CAR T cells, because we will use another trick to direct the T cells against, here again, CD19 positive cells or B cells. And it is shown here. So it's a bispecific antibody. So one arm recognizes CD19 on the target cells, and the other arm recognizes the T cell receptor, CD3, which is actually something here which is not uh, drawn. Well, if you bridge the two together with several of these chimeric antibodies, you will activate the T cell in contact with any B cell that is there around. And again, you will have a killing process. So this is another way of directing the power of T cell, of destruction by T cells, to precise uh, cells. The, again, you have a profound B cell depletion, normal and tumoral B cells, uh, and uh, many cytokines that are produced. You have cytokine storm, and it's also interesting to comment on the fact that it was observed that there is some neurological toxicity with both CAR T cells and these antibodies here. And eventually it was recently discovered that we have some CD19 positive cells in our brain, which are mural cells around uh, capillaries in the brain. So not B cells at all. This was not known. Uh, these are very rare cells in our brain, but it is sufficient to trigger local inflammatory reactions and destruction of these cells and uh, possibly nasty uh, side effects. Why I mentioned that is that it illustrates the extreme power of T cells to go everywhere in your body, find a target and lead to a local disaster. It is very useful for tumors, but it illustrates the importance of the specificity of the T cells you are using because otherwise you end up with very, very nasty uh, problems problems. This is a fantastic uh, experiment uh, uh, in patients. Now, for me, most patients, all these things do not work. Why is that? Well, it's important to comment on the fact I mentioned that, that because we know that we can make spontaneously T cells against our own tumors, well, then the, our tumors have been selected uh, to resist that system. It's has been known for quite a while. And more recently, it was uh, renamed as uh, immunoediting. What are the reasons for that? Well, it's fairly simple. One is that you can have very few or zero antigens on the surface for various reasons that are listed there. I will not go into too much detail here. Or you can have, and this is uh, much, much, much studied at the time being, uh, various mechanisms of local immunosuppression in tumors. This is clearly present uh, in many tumors for many, for many different reasons. Uh, and so several of these reasons can be uh, counteracted with drugs, for example, or antibodies that can block some of these uh, components. And so many groups are working now on strategies involving a, an anti-PD-1 antibody or PD-1 blockade together with one or several of these uh, modalities here to have a, a combined uh, treatment. So what is ahead of us? I'm absolutely convinced that it, we will probably laugh in 20 or 30 years uh, looking, back at, looking back at what we have obtained and achieved uh, today and in which conditions. Uh, so PD-1 is clearly a major advance and it will never uh, go away. I mean, it's, it's, it's very important in immunology and in cancer uh, immunology. Uh, we can barely identify the patients that will respond. So we are not very good yet uh, in terms of biomarkers, but we have some, some ideas. Uh, I'm convinced that many primary resistances are due to the fact that the patient has already mounted immune responses much before you see him or her for the first time and uh, have a diagnosis of uh, cancer. So it's a bit too late in many cases. 
And it's also interesting to comment on the fact that while uh, there was an enormous hope for non-toxic immune cancer treatments, because many of these antigens are really tumor specific. Well, what is done today bypasses this specificity completely because we are overstimulating all the T cells in the patient. So there is a promise that still has to be fulfilled by the scientific community. So in uh, Soon we will have many combinations. Um, all this is in clinical trials. There are thousands of clinical trials around that today worldwide. It's absolutely a gigantic effort. I'll show you uh, this. So lung cancer, and you see that if you give chemo uh, plus PD-1 blockade, it's much better than uh, chemo alone. This is one of these results of here combining chemo plus uh, immunotherapy. It will be important to use immunotherapy as soon as possible. This is kind of obvious, but of course it takes time. It takes time for regulatory reasons, completely understandable, but it starts adjuvant setting, neoadjuvant setting. Uh, precision medicine will come in here because we will have to identify the resistance mechanism in the tumor before we decide for this or that combo. It will take time because it's complex as usual, but we are going there definitely. We can predict which antigens are there or, and which ones are not there. It will be important to try to block ctna 4 pd one only on the tumor cells we wish to boost and not on all of them. So this is still a dream. And uh, well, that's for the future. This is coming, but we are still, I think, far from big successes to immunize patients, uh, which would be a nice way to, to obtain what, what we want. And the reason for this I've mentioned earlier. And this synthetic immunity, so using artificial constructs, new, completely new concept, uh, there is for sure an enormous future for that and not only for cancer, because we can dream of doing probably absolutely anything. And of course, the, the CRISPR-Cas9 CRISPR technology is giving us enormous possibilities uh, with uh, much, much less efforts than, than in the past. And there are also many aspects of our immune system that we have not tackled clinically yet. Uh, this is yet uh, to come also. So I think that the future can be bright if we work hard on this, it will not be easy. And even though I'm perfectly uh, aware of the fact that this picture could be dawn or sunset, I'm convinced that we are at the dawn of this uh, cancer, cancer treatment modality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre. That was a really interesting presentation and I think we will have a lot to talk about in the next session, which is the high level discussion. Um, Pierre, if you stay here, then we can also um, chat with you about some of these topics. I do stay, of course. Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, so then I'm going to pick up on some of the things that uh, Pierre mentioned on immunotherapy and starting with Bart, we know that immunotherapy, as Pierre mentioned, works extremely well for some patients and just doesn't work at all for others. Um, maybe can you shed some light on that and, and why that is and possibilities to predict which patients will respond better to immunotherapy? Sure, so as Pierre alluded to, there is quite large heterogeneity between responses we see to the most commonly used immunotherapeutics being the anti-PD-1, anti-PD-L1 monoclonal antibodies. Now, the way we, we try to, to, to model this is by reflecting on the fact that in order to be efficiently recognized by the immune system, at first, the tumor needs to be sufficiently immunogenic. And while there are other types of uh, antigens such as cancer testes antigens or overexpressed antigens, differentiation antigens. 
conceptual thinking nowadays put most of all the neoantigens first as being probably the most immunogenic antigens that are most easily recognized by the immune system. Now, some tumors have a lot of those neoantigens because they are caused by environmental uh, carcinogens such as tobacco smoke in lung cancer or UV, UV irradiation in skin cancers. So it means that those tumor cells will have a lot of potential to, be, to get recognized by, highly, uh, by high affinity uh, cytolytic T cells because these neoantigens are completely different from what is natural within the normal cells. And when this happens, then in those tumors, there is a, quite a proportion of them where there is only me one mechanism that withholds immunity from eradicating, and that is the PD-1, PD-L1 interaction. And by blocking this interaction, we can have immunity at play and eradicate the tumor. Now, what's been a bit of a disappointment is that now, it, even now, when with a lot of those therapies becoming a part of our standard treatment options, such as for melanoma, we have nivolumab, we have pembrolizumab, we have the combination of EP and Nevo available to us, we have not been able to really uh, pinpoint, validate baseline characteristics that can really with sufficient uh, specificity indicate which are those patients that take it away. And one thing I think I wanted also to share and to stress is that some patients, in my opinion, are most likely cured. I've been using these drugs from the moment they were introduced in the clinic phase two. And I now have patients that are out there 15 years beyond the first injection of the immune checkpoint inhibitor. They are in a complete remission. They have stopped treatment, some of them now for more than five, even 10 years, and they are surviving with any sign of, of disease or disease recurrence. But despite the knowledge that we have built, we are not, a, not able at baseline to really say who they are. We only know that we have tumor types which are enriched for those kind of patients and other ones which are not. And last thing I wanted to share and, and, and say is that I think also that from an academic point of view, it's important that we do try and find out who they are. Because like for instance, melanoma, 25% of our population will only need an NTPD1 therapy. Like for up of a year of treatment, we can stop. It's been shown that it's safe to stop with a low risk for progression beyond that point. But this is not necessarily in the interest of, of industry because simple treatment, short duration of time, it's, it's commercially not uh, of high interest. But I think as academics, we should really put an effort in there to try and know, find out who they are because with a relatively simple and safe treatment, we can save lives. Thank you very much, Bart. Um, I just, I'm just going to introduce you because I forgot to mention that just before. So Professor Bart Nains is the head of department at the Department of Medical Oncology at the Universitized Dickenhaus House in Brussels. And he is also a clinical professor of the Faculty of Medicine at the VUB. Thank you very much, Bart, for that, um, for that contribution. Um, so I will briefly introduce all of the panelists now so that I don't have to do this again. Um, so our first one is Liva Berink. She is a Flemish politician for the Open VLD party and she has worked as a pharmacist for nearly 30 years. From May 2016 until July 2019, Leva was a member of the European Parliament and in 2019 she was awarded the MEP Health Award for her work in healthcare. Dr. Dennis Lacombe is the Director General of the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer. This is the largest European non-governmental multidisciplinary cancer clinical research infrastructure. Dr. Lacombe has more than 150 publications and has also a significant level of expertise in European policy affairs. 
Dr. Ralph Herald is a senior scientific officer in the Regulatory Science and Innovation Task Force of the European Medicines Agency. He is a specialist in pediatric oncology, and previously he was the pediatric development leader in Bayer's Regulatory Affairs Organization. Professor Franco Locatelli is the head of the Department of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology at the Bambino Cresu Children's Hospital in Rome, and he is a full professor of pediatrics at the Sapienza University of Rome in Italy. He was recently appointed president of the Italian Higher Council of Health, which is the technical scientific advisory body to the Ministry of Health. Michael Zayek then is the Head of Medical Affairs from Novartis Oncology Region of Europe. Um, Michael's main interests are in oncology and immunology, as well as advanced analytics and AI, and general aspects of medical affairs and medicine development. Fabrizio Sistini then is here to give us the patient perspective. Fabrizio is a senior expert in digital social innovation with DG Connect of the European Commission. And his main area of activity has been the development of cooperative open platforms and open technologies for sharing of knowledge among citizens. So thank you all for being here. Um, now I will move back to what Bart has just said um, and pick up a little bit on that. Moving now to Dennis. Um, Dennis, Pierre mentioned that immunotherapy just works better for some cancers rather than others. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yes, so thank you for the, op thank you for the opportunity. Sorry, I have a lot of echo. So thank you for the opportunity and uh, thank you, Pierre, for this very nice uh, presentation. So I think a lot already has been said and I'm sure the clinicians in the room will elegantly complete what I, what I can bring to this, uh, to this debate. I think uh, what is uh, really uh, come, come really uh, to light is the challenge indeed to select the good patients, to find a good balance uh, between uh, activity, toxicity and how we manage these new treatments. So I can certainly give the, the perspective from the from the clinical from the clinical research point of view and indeed we have seen the fact that uh, clinical research has completely changed over the past years and uh, actually these uh, new approaches have also changed the regulatory pathway we, where we have seen uh, uh, new drugs uh, um, of this class, therapeutic class being approved yeah. across uh, across histologies so i think it's challenging quite a lot what we uh, what we have been what we have been doing of course, there are some toxicity profile eh, and mostly uh, they've been uh, these um, uh, immune mediated or, uh, so organ related toxicity or uh, Pierre has also referred to the to the cytokine storm and they are more or less uh, more or less uh, managed. Uh, so I think uh, all this, of course, is uh, we are uh, we are learning. Hopefully, indeed, uh, and uh, also Pierre mentioned, maybe in 20 years we will be laughing at ourselves. So new, uh, new, uh, certainly new approaches uh, will um, uh, will emerge. What I would like maybe to further develop in the understanding how to use these uh, how to use these drugs and manage, of course, with uh, the, the toxicity is also indeed to select the patients appropriately so that we don't impose toxicity uh, to patients who may not benefit of it or may benefit of, of, of less of it. And and here I think we have um, we have a lot to do, and it's a little bit uh, unlucky that we don't have um, Walter who stayed with us because I hope the the, 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 the cancer meeting plan and the cancer mission will understand that uh, actually some of the effort have to be put there in the post marketing area in academic research uh, to understand how to optimize and how to use these drugs in terms of selecting the patients. And maybe other can comment, but personally, I've been always struck by the fact that uh, in the same class of agent, you have different essays. Uh, and that patients from the same data sets uh, are positive or negative. So the level of positivity change depending on the, uh, on the essay. So you have the, the companion diagnostic developed with the drugs, but you have also a number of laboratory developed tests out there and the positivity can change 
depending on the test. So I think there are a number of things that we have to address, again, that are not necessarily addressed by the, by the commercial sector, which we should address indeed uh, as a community, as a community of researchers. So I think that would be the message. How do we optimize? How do we use what we have? And potentially, again, the new European mechanism to have this better balance uh, between activity and, uh, and, uh, and toxicity. But the last point I, I would like to say also more uh, on the on the I would say addressing the, the toxicity. What has been also very much a game changer is that you have seen the, the hematologists uh, who were uh, of course very acquainted with febrile neutropenia and so on being exposed to completely other type of toxicities. And um, and I think we see also in, in the management of our protocols a greater interaction between hematologists, people from solid tumor, intensivists, and so on to try to uh, really manage this, um, uh, this toxicity profile. So I think it's, it's been quite uh, challenging. We've been, we, we have been learning how to, how to work and uh, together differently. Uh, but I think what we also have to evolve is that we are still using in clinical research old recipe for all drugs. And indeed, I think we need also to modernize clinical research to, uh, to understand all these questions. Mm -hmm. Um, Pierre, maybe I can get um, your your input then on this um, on on the point that Dennis has made. Um, can you provide some more information on that? Do you agree that we need more um, selection of patients and that um, we need to be doing more in terms of um, regulatory issues as well? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So I mentioned that we still do not understand in details what is happening in patients even when they respond beautifully but of course behind this uh, vague statement uh, is the fact that we have no very good biomarkers because if we do not understand we cannot develop very good biomarkers so as mentioned by Bart, one is the mutational status of the tumor so many mutations means many antigens it's a kind of a simplification but it's okay for today and so this is a, a positive sign another that is often used is the looking at the tumor with histology and seeing that some contain t cells already and some others do not and it's in the first group that you will find more responders but nevertheless uh, even with these things and even when we combine them we cannot really predict uh, accurately. There are patients who are negative for these things, and because there is nothing that can be done, they are basically lost. Well, they receive this, and some of them respond extraordinarily, as, as Bart mentioned. So it indicates that we are still not there. Uh, so this is perfectly true. We need research. It, it's a matter of research. Uh, we need to use material from the patients, and well, regulations are tightening and tightening. This is much and much more complicated each time. So in our research labs, we should have now professionals at regulatory affairs to fill in all these papers and obtaining all the authorizations and all that to be able to do very simple things. And sometimes we have patients that tell us, well, you know, I don't care about all these things. What I want is to remain alive or treat my kid uh, that she or does not die. And I don't care about all these things. You can do whatever you wish, obviously. And if it can help others, and unfortunately not me or, or us, well, too bad, but it has to be done. So I, I think that the patients are not always in line with all these rules. But if we continue at EU level, but it's not only EU, of course, to have new layers of rules over rules over rules, well, the result is, well, we are slowing down. Very much so, practically. And we all see it from, if I compare what we can do, and Bart can confirm because we have been collaborating on this for decades, uh, there are things that we could do 15 or 20 years ago, and they have been quite helpful. We could not do it today. We could not. Is that a progress? 
well, not too sure. So that's one, of course, it's, it's easy to say, it's a little bit e less easy to find ways to, to, to improve uh, on the actual kind of political context worldwide, I have to say. Maybe there is another point I would like to mention that it was briefly alluded to by Bart, is that it's difficult to discuss on cancer immunotherapy and cancer immunotherapy progresses without mentioning the issue of financial toxicity. These are very expensive treatments, very expensive. And well, at the beginning, this is understandable. After a while, well, we, we absolutely need the pharma industry, of course. I mean, they, 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 are, they have been fantastically active. And it is because of them that we are there, because the, otherwise, uh, in the labs, uh, we could not have generated all these results and, and, sh and shown that this could be active in many different cancers and sometimes with big surprises. Uh, Hodgkin was not at all predicted to respond. It was even the country, and, and, and it responded beautifully. So pharma industry is absolutely key in the process of uh, even discovery and then drug development. But, well, uh, there is also some room for improvement there because today, and you see the comment here of, of Bart on uh, the fact that EU has not approved some of these drugs for uh, cancers with many mutations, uh, while it is accepted uh, in the US, for example. And I think that part of the reason is uh, economy. Well, we, of course, economy is key because without that, we have no drugs, we have no research, we have nothing. But for all of us, the objective is the patients. Mm -hmm. Um, well, maybe since we do have Novartis here, I will just ask um, Michael Zayik if you want to comment on that. Sure, I think we completely understand uh, the comments made on drug pricing. Um, I think what we are looking towards to is through partnerships to evaluate the real value of a medicine. What we're doing in Novartis, but that's not just us, is trying to find the right remuneration for the value we deliver. And as Bart and Pierre have nicely outlined, some of these medicines cure patients. The problem, of course, is that we don't have a model in place paying for single shot cures. I mean, we have the same issue in Novartis with CAR T cells. And we have to really work together with policymakers, with clinicians, with payers to come up with models which share the risk between us, but also gave a fair remuneration to the pharmaceutical industry based on the real value of the medicine. And we have to agree with the clinician and the patients actually, what is the real value of a medicine? Because of course it's no good to have an immunotherapy which potentially cures, but has in 70, 80, 90% of the patients long-term um, quality of life effects, which make living actually a burden. So I think that's, that's really what we have to go forward to. We count on a good collaboration. I think Pierre, Pierre said something, uh, the future is bright. I would agree with that, the future is bright if we work together. And I think we would love to see more of the working together to define the value, to define appropriate payment models. So it doesn't come to what has been criticized by Bart that the, yes, uh, medicines cost uh, a lot for a long time. Um, we really need to come to better models together. That's, that's my plea to everybody on the panel. And I think as a company, we're absolutely open-minded to have these kind of discussions. We have them every day for our CAR T cells. We're happy to have them for other of our medicines, including our immuno-oncology portfolio. And we count on the regulator and Ralph is on, on the line to help us, but we mostly count on policymakers and payers to help us with that and the clinicians and the patients to give us the information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, <laughs> I apologize. 
Um, thank you for that, Michael. Um, okay, now I'm just going to we move quickly to Franco Locatelli just to ask you, um, what about age? Does immunotherapy work better for older or younger patients? And is it applicable for children? Thank you so much for asking me this great question. Let me uh, articulate my answer in the following way. Uh, if we are talking about uh, antibody targeting uh, the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, the best results have been obtained uh, in Hodgkin lymphoma, as you already mentioned uh, during the beautiful talk uh, uh, by Pierre. But for other uh, pediatric cancer, uh, the effect obtained with this approach uh, were much more limited. By contrast, uh, using uh, either CAR T cells or bite or the new antibody drug conjugate, uh, you can obtain wonderful results, uh, in particular in the field uh, of uh, B cell lymphoid malignancies. Uh, and indeed, these approaches are revolutioning uh, the treatment of childhood uh, B cell precursor ELL, which represent the most frequent cancer of childhood. Uh, and the results that have been obtained, for example, with CAR T cells in the long term uh, are superior than those reported uh, in the adults in the most important publications available so far. Uh, clearly, we have uh, to work uh, together uh, for uh, rendering the approach uh, for example, with the genetically modified T cells available also for other pediatric tumors. And there are some initial results, uh, which in my personal opinion, are very promising in the field uh, of neuroblastoma, which represent the most frequent uh, extracranial solid tumor uh, of uh, uh, childhood. Uh, but uh, it's important, as already mentioned uh, by Walter Ricciardi during uh, his presentation, that uh, uh, pediatric patients can have uh, a faster access to the more innovative approaches, including those based uh, on immunotherapies. Fortunately, uh, childhood cancer is a rare disease, but there are still some unmet medical needs uh, despite uh, the great improvement uh, that we have achieved uh, over the years in the cure rate uh, of our children developing cancer. And uh, uh, taking also advantage of the presence of uh, Dr. Zayak, I think that uh, one key aspect is that of creating also in Europe uh, a win-win collaboration between the academic institutions and the companies in particular, uh, trying to implement the uh, privileged partnership, I would say, alliance between uh, academic institutions and uh, companies with the goal of translating uh, uh, the proof of principle approach is developed uh, in the academic institution on a larger scale. And finally, let me touch also the issue I mentioned at the end uh, of uh, Pierre's talk uh, on uh, the noble platform uh, to be employed uh, uh, for the car cell therapy in particular. Uh, I think that uh, one of the most important field of investigation in the next years will be that of having uh, some immediately available off-the-shelf products obtained from allogeneic third-party donors to be used uh, in patients with cancer uh, amenable to be treated with CAR T cells. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to ask, um, I'm just going to move to Pam Kearns now um, to ask you 
um, following up from what um, we've just heard, what would you think are the barriers to getting new drugs, including immunotherapies, licensed and available in the clinic for children with cancer? Thank you. I mean, and just want to echo all the comments by Franco. They're completely um, uh, on, on uh, message for what's happening in childhood cancer. The issue that we have with childhood cancer is that you cannot directly extrapolate the data from adult trials. And, uh, you know, it's, it was really fortuitous that, the, that drugs like the CAR T cells and the bites targeted CD19, which uh, targeted a B lineage ALL, um, which is the commonest type of cancer in childhood. So it, it get, gave us the impression of a fantastic step forward in immunotherapy for children. But actually, for the rest of the, the, the uh, um, drug development in childhood cancer, we are not doing so well. And there, there are three reasons. One is that it cannot be stated enough that childhood cancers are not just many versions of adult cancers. They are different diseases. They are generated from mostly embryonal cells as opposed to epithelial cells, which most uh, uh, um, adult cancers are derived from. So the whole biology is different. Um, and in, in the field of immunotherapy, you also have to remember that the immune system is different. It's a different stage of maturity. And we know, we, we know a lot about the fact that the level of uh, neoantigens is different in children, childhood cancers, but also we, their innate immune system is different. And it's likely that the T cell pathways are less uh, important in, in the uh, microenvironment of pediatric cancers compared, say, for example, to NK cells. So there's a whole separate area of research that needs to be developed. Given that most of the um, attention of drug development from the in industry perspective is going to go to where the biggest markets are, childhood cancers are not going to be high on the agenda. Uh, they are rare diseases. So we tend to end up looking at, for the most part, drugs that have been developed for adult cancers, and then the companies will look to see whether there is a possibility of their development in children, not because that is morally correct, but because there is a regulation that says they have to do it, and that's the, the pediatric regulation. But we know for a decade of the pediatric regulation, which was introduced in 2007, it has not created the benefit in pediatric cancers as perhaps it has for other pediatric diseases. And that is again because it is too easy to develop a drug for an adult cancer, for a target in an adult cancer, and say that target isn't relevant to children and therefore go for the waiver which is allowed in the regulation. There is a shift now, and it's, a, it's lovely to have Ralph Herald on the, on the panel, because within the EU regulation there has definitely been a shift in how it's being implemented. And the concept of saying if you've got a target for a drug that has been perhaps developed in, in uh, 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 prostate cancer or, or a colon cancer, which may not seem relevant to children, have a look at how that mechanism is actually relevant to the biology of a childhood cancer. And that mechanistic approach and the shift in the way the regulation can be implemented will allow drug development to be uh, shifted towards pediatrics. But we are a long way for that from that being mandated. And I think there is time for regulatory review to be able to not only more mandate that drugs are looked at in the pediatric population when they're available to adults, but more importantly, actually focus on that pediatric targeted regulation for drugs that may never be of interest to adults. And again, I come back to the CAR T cells, you know, they have been so successful in pediatric cancers, but had acute lymphoblastic leukemia being a rare disease in, in, in pediatrics, we perhaps would not have had um, quite so much excitement about it. So I think there are opportunities, but the opportunities are there for regulatory change. And just to pick up on the, the point that Franco made about partnerships, I think the only way we're going to drive pediatric uh, drug development is through partnerships. And it, it's not just the partnerships between uh, industry and academia, but we need to bring the patient groups along with us. You know, the, the tolerance of toxicity is something we need to ask patients and parents about, not just the academics and the regulators. And I think bringing them into that partnership is really important. Um, and actually having the regulators at the table. And we've done this in pediatric oncology uh, through a, a consortium called Accelerate, which is a, 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 a multi-stakeholder platform. It's a partnership between industry, academia, the regulators and patients and parents. And with that, we have an opportunity to take different areas of pediatric cancer drug development 
and decide on priorities. What should be taken forward? How should it be taken forward? And then working with all those stakeholders, work out the most accelerated pathway to do it. So I, I think we're in a difficult position at the moment. We really do not have enough drugs in childhood cancer, enough research in childhood cancer for drug development, but there's a pivotal moment. Um, I'm not quite sure whether it's quite the sun coming over the horizon, but we are in a pivotal moment that we can actually start working together as multi-stakeholders and use the knowledge that is out there and properly apply it for childhood cancer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to Ralph Harold now. Um, Ralph, um, I'm just going to pick up on Bart's point that he made earlier, which is that the EU has not approved um, ICI immunotherapy for MSIH tumours, um, but the FDA has. Can you give us a little bit of insight into that? Thank you, and this is a rich discussion. I'm thankful to be part of it. I think Bart put this word not yet in there, and um, let's, let's see. I can't really comment on specific procedures here. I think what we heard today are important elements, and I want to echo the elements of collaboration, the opportunities that are here and where we are in the current pandemic situation as a learning situation, and then link it to your question of um, how is it that uh, this is approved in the United States and, and not or not yet in, in Europe. I think we heard from Walter and from Franco and uh, Bart and uh, Pam opportunities for collaboration. And I want to extend this that the current pandemic teaches us also about what are opportunities to learn how to conduct clinical trials currently. I can hardly imagine how difficult it is to keep on doing the clinical trials with patients with cancer. Um, but Certainly, we are making all efforts at the European Medicines Agency, but also at the national competent authorities who regulate the trials to learn how the trials can be better supported. So, for example, how to move from physical visits to virtual visits and how to uh, tailor safety investigations. This is a huge opportunity for all of us to think together which of these elements are important for the trials for the safety of the patients, but that can also be carried on. In a recent neuro-oncology meeting, I heard how the neuro-oncologists were learning from other neurologists, how they are already using validated neurological function scales for Parkinson's disease and, and uh, um, multiple sclerosis, for example. So there is even uh, cross-fertilization across the uh, medical disciplines that can happen. And this comes at a time that um, in 2017, we have started the renovation of the GCP good clinical um, practice um, guidelines that should help us to focus on how can we get uh, high quality clinical trials and really make them also patient centered. And this, this is the opportunity where currently a number of initiatives are ongoing and we hope that um, even in the time of the pandemic, uh, we are continuing with exchanges to um, progress with the optimization of the trials and um, finding better ways of conducting the trials. Now, this is also related to, of course, uh, the authorization procedures and the um, requirements for immunotherapies are the same as for other medicines and are also uh, the same generally uh, in the different regions, even though the legal frameworks are different. And um, there have been several analyses, and at the moment it is known that uh, some cancer medicines are authorized in Europe later than, for example, in the United States and other regions of the world. But again, this is uh, a situation that we can aim to modify, that we can address. Uh, in Europe, we're currently providing extremely flexible support for clinical trials in the changes that I've mentioned to developers submitting data, the rolling reviews uh, that are now being undertaken for COVID treatments are very important and also provide us with lessons learned about how can we um, conduct procedures for other types of medicines. So in this sense, I would consider that the current situation uh, shows us a bit uh, what are the opportunities where we can uh, work in the regulatory system, but also together. And in this sense, I, I do rely and hope that this uh, not yet approved will uh, 
we will come to some news uh, in the near future. But uh, overall, I think this is um, where we can combine the elements of the clinical trials and the regulatory handling with the patient engagement. And just to make the point, we only three weeks ago had a symposium uh, where we focused on new elements in patient-centric research. We heard about the patient journey. Uh, we heard about novel ways of eliciting patient preferences, for example, to understand what patients really want if they are being asked uh, and how they express their choices. And these are the important opportunities at this point in time that uh, we're particularly eager to consider so that we can move on. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, thank you for that, Ralph. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of this, of course, like the European Commission is focusing on cancer in terms of the Horizon mission. Um, and we did hear earlier from um, Professor Ricciardi on this. I'm just going to move to Lieva very quickly. Um, Lieva Verink, from the side of policymaking um, and then referring back to the cancer mission, do you think that advances in immunotherapy are adequately catered for within the cancer mission? Lieva? Yes, I'm there. I have to unmute. Um, no so thank you very much for all the speakers for the very interesting um, explanation we received. Um, it, it goes far enough. Um, I think it's very difficult to say if it's not going far enough. It's, it's so a broad, um, a broad um, team cancer that it's very difficult to say you go far enough in this, in let's say in, in T cell immunology or something else. I think what is very important that now in Europe, we are talking about cancer. It's the first time we really talk about it. It has really a stand received. There is a mission. It was a very hard discussion um, we had with Carlos Maudas, who, who would like to have his missions. I supported it also, but for me, it was very important that we shouldn't talk only about childhood and child cancers. It's important we talk about a whole system of cancer because it's connected that we all know, but it's not only the connection we have, but it's the fact that there are so a lot of questions in it and all the questions in adult cancer or child can, childhood cancer, it's, it's all, always connecting on one or another way. So it's important that Europe is working on it. And I have to say that um, the, the Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. von der Leyen is really fantastic on this point. She's really supported and that's what we needed in Europe. So I think we will do a lot of things. And then second of all, I would say economically, it's really a problem because you can only spend a euro once and that's why it's so important we find the, the good biomarkers that when we spend, because the, all the treatments or not all, but a lot of the treatments are very expensive. So it's very important that it's the right treatment you give to the right patients. And, um, and like uh, already was mentioned, this research is so important to have better results because the results are depending also on, on the money. That we have to have the money to spend and the money, the money has been spent, has to be spent on, on the right way to the right patient with the right, um, with the right treatments. Um, we already mentioned that it's very important that we work all together, the best, and, but it's not only between um, industry and um, academics, but it's also important that member states work together and that, um, that the best practices are, are given to member states and member states give their best practices to other member states. And that um, clean, um, hospitals are working together on international way so we have to learn from each other. And, and I think this is a process Europe can help also um, by, um, by helping by the Erasmus system who is working on, on, um, on, uh, on students, with students, but do it also with specialists so, so they can give their best practices to a, 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 another specialist in a, in a member state. Um, I'm really thankful to be in the discussion. It's very interesting. Thank you. 
Okay, um, I'm just going to move to Dennis mm -hmm. Lacombe like now. Do these plans also sound plausible to you? And what are the main challenges that you think we will face in terms of achieving these goals? So Lieva has mentioned um, some, and also Pamela Kearns has mentioned some already. And um, so from your perspective, what do you think will be the main challenges? Yeah, so uh, first of all, maybe to echo a little bit what has been said about partnership, access, price, and all these type of things. I just would like maybe to share with you an experience. So maybe it was um, almost 10 years ago when the checkpoint inhibitor came, our melanoma group, the RTC melanoma group, had one question immediately. It was duration of treatment. And they wanted to do a randomized discontinuation trial uh, to actually answer this question, which obviously industry wouldn't do and would not support. So at that time, we asked a few countries to come in Brussels. We had a meeting in the, in, in the room and nobody understood what they were saying, what we were saying uh, about how are we going to answer this question. And I believe that, uh, again, please uh, uh, contradict me uh, if I'm wrong, but uh, still today we don't have this answer. Okay, so um, I, I, when we speak about partnership, working together and so on, of course we have to do it, but are we really developing the means to do it? And I'm not sure that today, if we, we would have the same question, I would have the solution for my melanoma group, how to provoke these discussions. Um, so I think, again, uh, we mentioned a lot of, the, of these elements, how we are going to work together, what are the key questions, how we are going to bring them together, um, uh, how are we going to achieve that, what are going to be the means, and what would be the partnership between industry, between the regulator, the HTA, and so on. So I think we have to reinvent uh, the a completely different ecosystem to address this and what will be the, the respective role of each uh, uh, stakeholder and and unless we achieve we really reinvent ourselves we unlearn what we have been doing to learn a new mechanism of clinical research of access of understanding what's in the data and so on I think we are going, we are not going to make uh, a lot of progress. So we have a lot of elements. I think we made fantastic progress, uh, but to me, it misses the, actually the how we are going, we, we, we are going to do that. So I think that's, uh, that's important to uh, how far the, the Europe, the, so the, the, the mission, the, the meeting plan again, are going to help that I'm not convinced at this uh, really at this type uh, at this uh, uh, at this moment we have seen Europe reinventing the wheel a lot we have they want to that uh, progress is delivered usually between five within five years and if you have to reinvent infrastructure to deliver a project in five years we know it's not possible it's not possible so what i've been missing also is mapping what exists there are fantastic national groups there are fantastic infrastructure how do we map that and come together for solutions so i think uh, we should not reinvent the wheel but we should be mapping all these ideas all the people who are out there and for me the success of europe would be actually to link that rather than reinventing things so voila so that's where i see the the limitation where i don't see how we can we can generate all that so today there is not really a place to meet in brussels in europe uh, for addressing all that and that's what i think is missing okay thank you very much dennis um I'd just like to ask um, Fabrizio for his perspective as a patient. Um, what, what does this cancer mission need to be looking for in terms of living with and living after cancer? Do you think it adequately tackles that? Um, and what kind of problems do you find that cancer survivors face in society? Thank you. Uh, well, first, uh, let me say that I'm very grateful for the, uh, all the research in this field as a cancer survivor because uh, Without this research, uh, I don't think I will be able to be here today. Uh, as for the cancer mission, I was really uh, surprised and pleasantly surprised by the objectives uh, set by Professor Ricciardi this morning. Uh, also because they really match uh, uh, the reflections I had uh, in these uh, last days about this issue. And uh, fundamentally, I have uh, three points that I would like uh, to, uh, to briefly uh, talk about. Uh, one uh, is about the complexity of cancer and the non-medical aspects related to it. I am an engineer, so I, I don't want to enter into medical aspects, of course. 
But uh, listening uh, at the presentations, uh, uh, I have a curious feeling that uh, uh, we know more uh, about the remedies to cancer than uh, about the causes of cancer. And yet we know that, of course, we, there are certain conditions uh, um, under which some cells will develop a cancer, but which conditions uh, which will determine a cancer in a particular patient are almost impossible to predict. Uh, all these factors are uh, factors which we know, for instance, uh, food, of course, the food that we eat, uh, the hormones, the pesticides, the sugar, the alcohol, but also the food that we don't eat, so the fruits, the vitamins that we miss out, the variety, etc. Of course, there is the air that you will breathe, the pollution which is generated in the street, the radiation, but also the pollution generated in, in, inside our houses, uh, the quality of sleep, which is so essential uh, to physical and mental balance and also to a solid immune system, which is key, for instance, for a cancer like mine, which is myeloma. Uh, the physical activity, which also has been proven to enforce the immune system and then to prevent or even to cure in some cases, is all to help curing uh, cancer. Uh, the chronic inflammations, uh, for instance, caused by allergies or intolerance, and then up to uh, all the growing uh, field of research in the area of microbiome. Uh, which has uh, uh, unexpected, surprising, strong interactions with the development of so many conditions, including uh, uh, probably cancer. So uh, all this uh, uh, is a complexity that uh, we must tackle. And uh, I, I am very glad that this is in the objectives of the cancer mission. Uh, the second point, uh, which is related to this, uh, is uh, um, the question for myself as a patient, what can I do more to help contributing, to help understanding uh, this uh, complex illness and to help developing uh, uh, appropriate treatments for it? And again, here I speak as an engineer, as a civil servant uh, who for most of his life has tried to develop platforms for sharing knowledge, for allowing citizens to share useful information and to collectively solve uh, societal issues. And in this respect, I note that today there is a large availability of tools to collect data about the health, not only bracelets, smartphones, even rings. And all this wealth of data then can be harnessed to make correlations between, for instance, the food that we eat, the air we breathe, the conditions we develop, the amount of medicines we take. If we could put all this together and try to make these correlations in an open manner, so not subject also to, to copyrights, to restrictions uh, that we have for commercial reasons, but also for very legitimate reasons for GDPR, et cetera. I wonder uh, what, how much this could contribute to the progress of treatments and especially to the progress of personalized treatments to people, because we know that uh, medicines and not the same impact on different individuals. And we also know that most of cancer treatments, well, immunotherapy less in some cases than others, but still have heavy side effects. So finding the minimum dosage, which still is effective while minimizing the side effects is a key issue in medicine. And it can only rely on this large amount of data that can be collected nowadays. And then, uh, cutting short because I don't want to take too much time. Uh, the last point uh, is uh, uh, what I thought was the elephant in the room, but uh, I've already heard it uh, several times uh, today, which is the moral question related to the cost of these treatments. Because uh, the cost of the treatment I get, uh, I got every week and now every month, uh, is uh, uh, an amount of money which probably could save a thousand of children from starvation or which could ensure to these thousands of children a better education and a better future for their life. So uh, is this cost really commensurate to the amount of research which has been invested in this? Who determines uh, this cost? Who determines whether it's worth uh, the, the result that we obtain? Uh, in all these questions, there is a lack of transparency, a lack of visibility, which is disturbing from a moral uh, point of view. Um, and uh, um, I, I really wonder what can be done, for instance, uh, um, on the regulatory side, mandating uh, full transparency on the pricing policies uh, uh, of the big pharma companies. 
uh, or for instance, uh, as for the big issue of who decides which clinical trials uh, are conducted and launched. For instance, why don't we create an independent body funded by uh, a fixed share of private research uh, profits to assess which trials to launch uh, and to manage them? Uh, Perhaps I'm sure that I'm not the first one to come up with these proposals, but I really think we have a big wall to, to break if we want to, to progress on a more sustainable and ethical society in this respect. So just to summarize then, I think my three points are one, to promote a more multidisciplinary approach to the understanding of the etiology of cancer and the possible non-medical therapies. Uh, the second is uh, to more proactively involve the patients and the citizens, which are not patients perhaps yet, uh, in the research, investigating the crowdsourcing approaches and the personalized medicine. And third, to promote a, a large scale political and social debate on the moral questions surrounding the drug development and the marketing of drugs uh, to enhance the existing regulation worldwide. And what all these points have in common, I think, is they all call for a more proactive role of the public in terms of regulation and funding in medical research. And I'm happy to see that these actions, to some extent, for what I've understood from the short presentation of Professor Ricciardi, are included in the mission of the cancer mission. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much, Fabrizio. Um, maybe I will just let Ralph respond very quickly to your question um, relating to whether regulators can do anything about the financial side of things. Um, and then we'll move on to talking a little bit about COVID-19 and the impact that that has had on cancer research. So Ralph, if you could just respond there very quickly. Yes, so the my agency, is not in, involved in financial discussions. The pillar for authorizing medicine are demonstrating its safety, quality, and efficacy. However, we are hugely concerned and interested in access of patients, access of patients with a cancer to medicines. And to this end, there are collaborations, for example, with health technology uh, organizations uh, that assess the, the medicines and introduce them for reimbursement into the healthcare systems. Um, we do this um, at the time of development in scientific <laughs> advices and um, at the time of evaluating, assessing for authorization. And we also know that this element of access is a big element in the Europe Beating Cancer Action Plan, where we also will support this to progress so that um, we have a better and comprehensive access of patients across Europe and the member states uh, to cancer medicines. And, uh, and, and this is where, how I'm describing the role of our agency as part of a, of a network of responsibilities that are shared, not just across the member states but in Europe, but, but really across the organizations that, uh, that are involved here. Um, there are some things that we can do that many things we can't do uh, have an impact on the price, but uh, for example, we are able to uh, clearly describe the effects of the medicines and, um, uh, and the uh, patients who uh, can be recommended for treatment. But even the question of what is the best treatment of a patient already goes into the realm of uh, Bart and Pierre and, and also Denis a, a bit when it's about how to best identify patients. This is often a question that we uh, cannot see solved at the time of authorization, but that requires continuous um, generation of data so that's uh, well understood and, and can then feed into the process of uh, providing access for the patients who would best benefit from the drug. Okay, thank you very much, Ralph, for that. Um, I'd like to then move quickly to Bart. Um, Bart, if you would like to outline for us exactly how COVID-19 is affecting your um, cancer research, of course, the pandemic has a huge influence, I'm sure. Um, so please let us know. Sure, I'm happy to. So first of all, during the first wave, so in spring of this year, uh, we reflected on how we would adapt our practice at my uh, university oncology center, um, 
And for my department of medical oncology, we actually decided that as most of our care goes towards patients who have a, a, a life-threatening illness, advanced cancer, we would decide not to change our practices and try to on hold, hold on on providing all the necessary care. And I must say that we have been successful in doing so, so far. We haven't amended any of our standard uh, therapeutic care we provide to our patients. The, the real uh, stress or difficulty managing this was with the fact that some of my physicians, physicians in training, but also members of staff were reallocated to uh, departments taking care, of course, of COVID patients, the, the huge number of patients that needed to be helped for their infectious diseases at the ICU, at the urgency department, at the units of uh, infectiology. So that, that really has put quite a burden in terms of not being able to take uh, planned holidays, working over hours, et cetera. But we've dealt with it. Some differences between the first and the second wave were that during the first wave, we had little issues, very few of our patients being infected, as well as nursing staff. In the second wave, it's changed. It's very difficult nowadays not to be confronted with a high-risk contact because a lot of patients are coming in, showing up, telling us that they have been either diagnosed or having symptoms, having fever. And the real difficulty now in managing this situation is that ideally we would want to have a, a, different, uh, a different way of, of seeing patients. So isolating infected, infected or potentially infected patients from non-infected patients. And just because of, of the structural needs to do that, which are not available to us, it's putting really uh, it's putting putting us often in a more difficult situation than before even so even on top of that we are seeing more of our uh, nurses healthcare professionals getting infected infected with the virus uh, luckily so not <coughs> not the decisions so far and with respect to to the clinical research i think there of course the the, the covid pandemic is really uh impacting severely because during the first wave and now also during the second wave, recruitment to uh, clinical trials is being suspended at my, at my institution. So that's really impacting on, on how we can provide access to, to innovative therapies, uh, having patients in need of, of innovative options uh, being recruited on, on clinical trials. And more so, I'm, I'm, I hope that this situation will, will not is too long because also in terms of uh, our academic trials having having to stop recruitment of course slows down the trials and funding is foreseen for a limited period of time and my PhD students my staff working on these trials needs to be paid so if we are slowing down we will not be able to to fulfill our promises or to 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 uh, uh, obtain our objectives in according to what's been promised within the protocols and that's giving me re really some uh, some issues at the moment thank you no problem um george maybe i'll just uh, move to you on this as well are you experiencing similar problems to bart um from your side with relation to covid and cancer research well yes the the uk health system uh, of course it is is pretty well developed but in terms of cancer screening, uh, this, uh, we have many, many tens of thousands of, of adult patients who have not had access to cancer screening because of the, the diversion uh, of clinical facilities and, and uh, doctors, as, as Bart has been uh, saying. Uh, the health service is, is trying to address this question now very, very uh, carefully. Uh, because we, we, th th there is a huge backlog. Uh, breast cancer screening, for example, uh, has been really very severely hit for one of the, uh, one of the cancers which can be uh, successfully uh, treated if detected early. So, uh, yes, I mean, there has been a, a, a diversion of clinical activity. And I suspect this is true of all 
European countries, actually, and there'll have to be something to redress this, uh, uh, this situation. Mm -hmm. And do you think there would be any long-term impacts then from that? Well, who can say at the moment? I, I mean, uh, the, uh, I'm not an oncologist. Uh, I, I'm a professor of medicine and infection at one of the London uh, uh, schools. Um, it, my oncology colleagues that I work very closely with are, are very concerned about this because w we all know that cancer screening is a, is a crucial aspect of, of cancer care with early uh, diagnosis being uh, one of the parameters we have at the moment to be influencing and to do, be doing well on. Uh, this will have to be looked at very clearly and carefully in all of the European countries actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the impact of this, we still don't know. <laughs> um, I'm going to move to Michael very quickly um, to ask about the supply chain in terms of cancer drugs. Has this been affected by the pandemic at all? Yeah, maybe I can answer you in three ways there. So if we look at innovative medicines um, not related to COVID, um, there's been no effect for Novartis. And I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of most other big pharmaceutical companies because we have uh, dual sourcing systems and uh, where we don't have a dual sourcing system, meaning at least two factories producing the product, we have um, sufficient emergency stock. Um, so for cancer medicines, uh, certainly not. Uh, of course, we're also a major supplier of generics and there, we have seen a huge increase in demands of those generics used on ITUs. Um, and we had to respond to that because we didn't have the supplies. So we were able to actually uh, ramp up our production to meet the demands. Um, what we are suffering a little bit from, I guess it's uh, the, the classic toilet paper example in the EU is, is the, the hamster buying and the forward buying. And uh, there we need the collaboration of everybody to help us to manage our supply chains. So in general, when we can do that, our supply chain stand. And then there is a, a third part, um, which are COVID-related medicines. So we had a number of medicines repurposed and in clinical studies. We uh, have given uh, a number of medicines available for free to large amounts of patients in Europe. And these medicines, we uh, basically uh, increase production capacity 10 times so that we can now um, supply instead of a thousand patients, hundred thousand patients minimum um, in, in the world to make these medicines available should the clinical trials for them succeed. And that's just basically by optimizing the way we use our factories. So we switched factories away from certain products which there wasn't a demand towards the medicine. <laughs> And essentially, we introduced instead of one shift, three shifts. So we are working in three shifts to make these medicines available to have the supply chains ready. Um, we have started the negotiations with the European government to make sure soon, if the trial should be successful, that we can also supply the medicine. Um, so in a nutshell, really, it's, it's all about collaboration and we've learned a lot from the COVID times. We've really experienced a lot of positive collaboration with local governments. And we really hope, and I think Val said this about the learnings of EMA, we really hope that this collaboration also continues because what we saw when the first wave stopped is we also saw a very quick reverse into some old habits. And, and, and that's really what we don't want. We really want this energy that's working together from the COVID times to stay with us, the positive learning to stay with us. And again, for us, this has meant that we could supply all patients and more. So for some products, really, we had a, tr a tremendous um, demand. And uh, I think to my knowledge, no patient in Europe hasn't got the product, especially as for COVID, we provide it for free. Thank you very much. Sure, and um, I'm just gonna move then to Franco Locatelli. How has it impacted on your pediatric work? Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, 
let me start from uh, the research part and in particular from uh, the translation and research part and I fully concur with what Bart said, uh, namely that, that there was a negative effect uh, on uh, the possibility of running uh, some uh, experimental projects and these uh, uh, certainly also led uh, to the request of uh, several institutions uh, to ask a, pro a prolongation of uh, the timeline uh, that uh, was agreed for running uh, certain uh, uh, research projects. In terms of conduction of clinical trials, uh, the effect uh, was certainly lower uh, of course, as already mentioned by Ralph, we had uh, to test and validate in a certain way, if you wish, to invent a new mode uh, for performing uh, uh, visits and audits uh, for uh, checking the data of patients enrolled into the clinical trial. But what I like to uh, particularly emphasize uh, is that uh, recently the major pediatric uh, uh, cancer scientific association have expressed great concern on the risk that uh, peer to access to medical care raised by COVID-19 may cause delays uh, with uh, dramatic consequences that uh, pediatricians are not used to face. Indeed, uh, let me mention uh, two papers that were published in Italy, one uh, uh, by the colleagues working in Naples. Uh, they reported three cases of children uh, with uh, ALL disease uh, in which uh, uh, we have an expectation of uh, five-year eventually survival in the order of 85%, uh, which were referred very late uh, uh, to the hospital exactly for the fear that I was alluding to. And uh, two of them died uh, because of the late diagnosis. The other experience was published by my group, uh, in particular uh, on children with uh, uh, brain tumors, uh, which uh, were referred to us uh, again late, uh, and we had uh, to perform uh, an urgent uh, uh, neurosurgery for uh, uh, stabilizing uh, uh, what we can define a uh, decompensated situation. So. Uh, what uh, is really important in my personal view also considering the limited uh, uh, risk, very low risk uh, of uh, mortality in the pediatric population is that uh, of uh, sensitize uh, at the public opinion uh, that uh, uh, patient, pediatric patients with a possible diagnosis of uh, cancer uh, not be refer too late uh, uh, because this could irreversibly compromise their chance of cure and maybe uh, also their quality of life if they survive uh, uh, to the, the acute uh, the compensated situation. Thank you very much. Um, so then, Pamela, can I just ask you very quickly how COVID has impacted the work of Cancer Research UK? Um, thank you for that question. I mean, Cancer Research UK, um, as you know, is very dependent on phil philanthropic donations. And one of the biggest impacts of um, COVID-19 has been the inability to raise the finances that as with many uh, charity organizations that was possible before and that's you know through the the kind of events that you would normally have that would bring lots of people together to do fundraising and also because the the CRUK shops for example um, had to close during the, the deepest parts of, of the uh, pandemic um, and so this year CRUK has already cut 44 million pounds um, sorry I can't convert that to euros um, from its research program and 
the baseline funding for uh, CIUK is normally in the region of 400 million pounds per year. Um, and it's anticipated that is going to be reduced to 250 million. So that's a massive cut in research funding. And that's going to already having an impact on, on laboratory based research. Many laboratory based, based research programs have had some funding, uh, funding cuts made. Um, and researchers are concerned uh, about their futures. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, people that have got programs, five year programs of research that are unclear whether they're going to be able to deliver their research funding. Um, at the moment, clinical research, as in trials research, has been uh, reasonably uh, protected because it is continuing to deliver at the moment. But uh, if the funding landscape remains as it is, um, it's hard to know whether that can also continue. So it may be that we end up with CIUK not being able to fund um, as many of the complex trials as it, it currently funds. And this isn't just... Um, Cancer Research UK, the Academy of Medical uh, Research Charities in the UK together have been uh, uh, you know, all concerned about this current position and are asking governments uh, to, for support, uh, particularly in the short term, until there's a bounce back of this ability to raise funding. If I can maybe put a slightly positive uh, note in what sounds a very doom and gloom uh, uh, description of the current circumstances, I think one of the opportunities um, coming out of COVID-19 is a bit of a rethink about what is funded, um, to really think about what sort of research in cancer we ought to be looking at and perhaps going for um, more uh, uh, of the big challenges. Um, this is certainly the case in Europe with the cancer mission. I think the cancer mission funding uh, in, in the EU and the focus on the EU beating cancer plan has really sharpened during co the COVID pandemic because the, what is actually important really becomes uh, um, up to the, to the, the top of the tree. And certainly Cancer Research UK, in spite of its financial concerns, are working with the NCI in the US and have just launched their Grand Challenge Program, the Cancer Grand Challenge Program, and that's focusing on, on the big exploratory innovative science uh, and asking um, for researchers to do multidisciplinary uh, international collaborations um, and put applications in on, on, on seven big areas, everything from uh, the prevention side, um, looking at things like uh, e-cigarettes, right through to some, you know, the, the really innovative science in senescence and, and macromolecules uh, and, and extra chromosomal DNA research. So I, I think, yes, we're in a, a dire strait at the moment, and it's really, really a concerning time for most cancer researchers, whether they're clinical or laboratory based. But I think we have an opportunity now to really think about how we do cancer research in the future and learn lessons uh, from what we've, we've gained uh, in both in terms of priority, but also, uh, and just coming back to the call out about regulatory uh, control of research, I think we learned during the COVID pandemic about how to be efficient from the regulatory point of view. The EMA, and certainly in the UK, the MHRA really responded and showed that you could be nimble in terms of getting research up and running. And I think this is something we need to take forward into the future. So really difficult times at the moment, but I hope we've got uh, better times in the future. Thank you very much, Pam. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to direct these to Pierre, but if any of the other panelists also want to um, weigh in, please feel free. Um, the first question is, is there a correlation between the intrinsic mutation frequency in the subclones of a tumor as shown by Clevers et al for bowel cancer and failure of PD-1 and CTLA-4 blockade? Do emergent tumors in the face of PD-1 treatment have evidence of escape from T cell recognition? For example, more allelic loss of MHC, et cetera. That is a very, very precise question. Uh, the very, very precise answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay, that's grand. Does anybody else want to comment? No. Oh. Maybe, okay. maybe the first part of the question could quickly repeat and I can provide an answer. Sure. It's, is there a correlation between the intrinsic mutation frequency in the subclones of a tumor 
as shown by Clevers et al for bowel cancer and failure of PD-1 and CTLA-4 blockade? Sure. I think one thing that is of relevance is that we already discussed the importance of neoantigens as probably main drivers of immune recognition and later on when recognized uh, tumor regression mediated by the immune response. So if you want the ideal situation, then these mutations should be there clonally, meaning that it should be an early event and all of the subclones which emerge upon additional mutations um, should still carry that, those antigens because if you want an immune response to eradicate all tumor cells, the immune system could pro probably not keep up with responding to every subclonal event. So another angle on this is if you have a tumor that's highly unstable and accumulates during progression multiple mutations, it's highly likely also that some mutations will occur, for instance, in genes that, uh, that, that are important for the antigen presentation machinery. And I think to some extent, this is what we are seeing from time to time in the clinic in what we see as mixed responses, meaning that you can have a patient that responds, responds well to checkpoint inhibition and has a marked regression of many lesions, and still one of the lesions will not respond. And if you try and dig into what's happening there, very often you can find that this is a subclone where a mutation has occurred that, for instance, eliminates the beta-2 microglobin. So the more unstable a tumor is, the more higher the risk that eventually it will develop subclones that may no longer be immunoresponsive. Okay, thank you very much, Bert. Um, we have one more question from the audience, which is following on from the first question, will it be important to understand if um, our resident subclones are present before treatment starts or do they arise under immune selective pressure? Well, they are both, of course. So it's, when you start a treatment, the tumor is already heterogeneous, and Bart ex explained uh, that very clearly. And possibly new subclones uh, are selected during the treatment by the treatment. So we we have both, and a tumor is con continuously changing. Of course, that's. That's an important concept when well, it's, 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 it's pretty clear. There are reports by the group of Gallon in Paris and, and, and a few others that suggest that when you look carefully at all the mutations you have in uh, colon carcinomas, for example, you find less so-called antigenic mutations than expected. So it's a bit complex, but we can predict that a given mutation will of course change an amino acid in a protein and that this will lead to an antigen on the cell surface. It has to be presented by HLA molecules. So, so there are constraints of binding to HLA molecules behind all that. And we, we have tools to predict this binding. And if you do that uh, with random mutations, you can calculate how many of these mutations should lead to an antigen on the cell surface. There are results suggesting that the, the actual number in, in colon cancers are lower than that. And that would suggest that there has been already a selection by the immune system, and this would be T cells here, that have eliminated the most antigenic cells. I think it's wise to wait for confirmations by several other groups because this, this is big data business, but well, it's, it's in the air. I think it's a logical result, expected result. It does not mean that it's true. Maybe, maybe to add the thing for us, it's an interesting research challenge. So how do we predict the development of the tumor 
um, in its subclones and how can we potentially double personalize immuno-oncology to not just use the autologous CAR T cell, but also to prime the autologous CAR T cell with a potential to react to a number of emerging subclone or clonal evolutions of the tumor. And as Pia said, that's a challenge of artificial intelligence and where we're trying to get the good data and to predict how do tumors react if you do X, Y, Z to them? And I think it's an interesting collaboration between academia and industry because none of us has the answer to it, but together we may have. Um, so really interesting challenge. We haven't cracked it yet, but we could in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, Okay, so as we move now towards the end of our session, <clears throat> I would just like to remind you all that this session will be recorded and it will be online in the coming days. Um, so if any of the listeners want to um, get access to it in the coming days, no problems there. Um, before, we, before we wrap up, um, I would like all of our panelists to quickly um, comment on two issues. One is what is a key development that you would like to see in terms of cancer um, cancer research or immunotherapy or policy. Um, so just one development that you would like to see the most. And the second question would be, how can we um, prevent future pandemics from having the same impact on cancer patients? So just two questions to think about very quickly. Um, and we will go, and I will go around. Um, maybe I'm gonna start with Pierre. Pierre, do you have um, something there? Well, the dream progress. I'm a researcher, so the the dream progress is the dream progress is something completely unexpected that I cannot predict. So something completely new, out of the blue, that changes everything. And I can tell you that the success of PD one uh, to treat patients, well, I, I I said it. I think is completely was completely unexpected. Nobody ever imagined that this would exist and that there would be something so important to control uh, T cell responses and not only T cells, by the way, because it's also another sense. So out of the blue and look at what we are after, I don't know, 20 years. So I think that the real major progresses, we cannot predict them. Mm, that's it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would have done it already. <laughs> because we are many smart people around the world trying to do everything that is possible, so. <laughs> okay, so something completely unexpected. Lovely, thank you, Pierre. Um, Lieva, maybe from your side now? I'm sorry, you're muted, Lieva. <laughs> no worries. Um, I agree with Pierre Coulis. Um, we are waiting for the unexpected. I'm also about the pandemic. You also asked mm -hmm. um, what in the next pandemic or the next big problems you have that screening should continue mm. because um, it's really the start of damaging the, the problem of cancer and, and screening is so important. So it's the first thing what will not happen, but it has to happen the next time. It's one of the lessons we have to learn from this pandemic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leva. Um, Bart, maybe for you? So what could I possibly add to what's already been, been said? Uh, perhaps, first of all, that maybe we should provide more room also for uh, funding and supporting studies that try and optimize the use uh, of immunotherapies beyond the point of registration. So beyond what Purely, what most often drives uh, development by pharma, commercial interests. I think there is a lot to be learned and a lot to be optimized with the use of immunotherapies. And uh, then is alluded to the fact that although there are brilliant ideas, for instance, studying the duration of therapy, unfortunately, those efforts perhaps have not been deployed to, to their maximum. And I think that that may be important. Um, for sure, continuing to, to explore, I think there are still many highly exciting uh, 
avenues to explore, intralesional therapy, uh, for instance, um, development of CAR T therapies, be it as a standalone or in combination. I think I look I look with, with great interest how to to these will impact in, in the coming years on how we can deal with incurable tumors. And with respect to the pandemic, I think our scientists let them provide an answer, the ideal solution. Uh, for now, I think restructuring the way we care for patients, trying to minimize contaminations within the, our clinics, etc., is what, what we are, are left to do not right now. Thank you very much, Bart. Um, Franco Locatelli, from your side. Yes, thank you. I personally have uh, two hopes and desires, namely that, uh, uh, of course, I am talking as a pediatric among experts, uh, that there will be much more resources available for running uh, high quality and high level initiative in the field of uh, uh, childhood cancer, uh, uh, providing the background for joining uh, the centers of excellence uh, in the field uh, of pediatric hematology and oncology for creating a sort of critical mass for them interacting uh, also with the companies. And the second desire, and this is particularly important uh, for me and uh, I hope that we can get some uh, support uh, uh, from Ralph uh, is that of uh, trying to render uh, the, the, the academic clinical trials more easy to be run uh, in uh, the context of a continent where there are uh, very different uh, national regulation uh, and laws that preclude uh, at least in part uh, the possibility of conducting these studies. Thank you very much. Um, Dennis, some last words from you. Yes, so I will take the policy option which you proposed. So certainly uh, to uh, find new routes how to do independent clinical trials or so clinical trials that are addressing the key questions. So what basically Bart has just said. So maybe structure in the process of access solutions where we can deliver data sets, which are important for the patient, for the, for the clinicians, for the healthcare system to give, uh, to give access. Because again, when a drug is on the market, the work does not stop, it's actually, it starts. How to understand how to use it, uh, whether it's the biomarker, whether it's the dose, whether it's the duration, whether it's the combination and so on. And I think that we don't have. So that would be, if I would have a magic stick, is how do we reinvent uh, um, ourselves? And again, following uh, on what Franco had just said, that if we allow that, if we can make this happening, then indeed we have to find, uh, um, I would say, uh, solutions where we address the bureaucracy, uh, because uh, that uh, otherwise is not going to be uh, to be possible. I think when you do, uh, there are different. We have the possibility to have risk uh, risk based approaches when you don't know think about the drugs, when you know more about a, a, a treatment. And I think we have to be much more clever in the way we, uh, we develop um, our, um, our, our research. So that would be my wishes if, uh, if I could change uh, a few things in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, Ralph, then to you for your final word. Thank you. I think a key development uh, from the immunotherapies is that um, firstly I want to say that these are all personal comments and um, and and then the, the key uh, development that we see is that perhaps given that over 15 years um, this was introduced but uh, important questions are open we need to think of could a learning healthcare system help us to compress the time so that these questions can be earlier asked and answered. So the, the, the question of the immunotherapies leads me to say, could we not think of the European Beating Cancer Action Plan and the cancer mission as 
as part of an integrated learning healthcare system where really there is a continuum of uh, such questions and answers being created. But more importantly then also, how do we prevent, um, that was your second part of the question. I think I have no specific or concrete answer on how exactly we can prevent the impact of a similar pandemic, but we have some thoughts of how we can get there. And this is that we have high quality and safe harbor discussions on clinical trials. The clinical trials are the research engine in Europe. And I think it's about our way together there by means of such discussions that we can find out what will make this ecosystem, this complicated but necessary system of the, the engine of research more resilient and future-proof. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ralph. And um, Fabrizio, then to you for a final word. Oh, well, uh, <clears throat> as for the treatments, I am already benefiting from the unexpected. So uh, I expect much more, of course. But as for the COVID, uh, um, perhaps it's curious to know that, that um, uh, I think I have not been impacted more than normal citizens by COVID, uh, uh, on the contrary, perhaps. Uh, because, uh, well, you know, uh, having a, a reduced immune system, uh, then I was a subject to uh, a frequent pneumonia and uh, uh, other uh, uh, diseases. And uh, in this period, uh, um, uh, since uh, because of the possibility of going outside with a mask uh, and because of the increased awareness of, of everybody else, including components of my family, but also external people, about the gen normal hygienic rules, uh, which unfortunately uh, are normally not respected, uh, at least before COVID, uh, my health is much better and they're much less subject uh, to common diseases, which normally would have spread uh, uh, and taken me as a first target. So, uh, there is perhaps uh, some uh, um, uh, uh, opportunity to, to be uh, caught in uh, the COVID, in, in the uh, habits related to uh, living with COVID uh, that uh, uh, could be maintained or just explored or studied uh, to, to see what could be the, the possible benefits. Also in terms, for instance, of the uh, increased the sleeping time, uh, I've seen recently a study showing that uh, we sleep normally 30 minutes more because of uh, the commuting time that we save by teleworking. And that has an impact on cardiovascular diseases, a measurable impact uh, according to this study. I wonder whether long-term studies uh, will prove uh, that uh, this uh, 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 prolonged sleeping time, uh, this 30 minutes long period of sleep, uh, uh, could have an impact also on cancer, but of course that takes a much longer time to prove uh, uh, and a much long, larger sample of people to study. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Fabrizio. Um, Michael, then for a last word from you, and then I'll move to Pam and then George to finish off. Yeah, for me, it's um, to uh, follow up what Dennis said, is collaboration that we sit together and plan the development of medicines together. That should, for me, result in for me, my dream as a clinician and as a researcher, double personalization of immunotherapy. But then maybe also when I practice as a clinician that um, to avoid pricing discussion that we also make medicines available according to what individual patient needs. We tend to treat everybody um, the same. And of course, if you spend the time talking with a patient in practice, uh, different patients have different needs and want to have different things done to them. And I think that would tremendously help with regards to the pricing discussions going forward. Um, with regards to the next pandemic, um, which will surely come in hopefully still in our lifetime, or not hopefully, but likely in our lifetimes, I wish that we not just look at the, the near-term risk as we seem to have done now, but that we take a fuller picture of the risk as it is in completeness or it could be in completeness and that we have meaningful discussions not about just tomorrow and managing a number like R0, but really to manage health in total and collaborate across Europe to make that happen because no one single country in Europe can achieve that. But together as EU, we could have done. And I think that's my hope for the next pandemic. Okay, final word from you, Pam? 
Um, just very quickly, lots of fantastic things have already been said, but just one area that I think I really would like to see perhaps in the next decade is the transparency of data. And there's been a lot of promise from big data um, from all the different sources, omics, clinical trials, real world data, and yet we haven't really cracked the, the integration of uh, different data sets from different sources, be it different institutes or different countries. Um, and we, yeah, I'm never hearing it from patients or, or families that they're worried about their data use. They want the data use for research and we need to, we need to facilitate that. So I think a, a genuine big data plan that delivers, I'd like to see. In terms of the next pandemic, um, it is inevitable. What I would like to see is that while scientific competition is always good uh, in normal circumstances, in dealing with a global pandemic, we need to work together. And there needs to be international collaboration that is not about individual, either companies or scientific institutions uh, point scoring over each other. They need, we need to work together and have proper collaboration so that we, we more rapidly find the solution uh, when we're faced with this next time. Thank you, Pam. And George, final words from your side? Well, thank you very much. And uh, I mean, what a terrific uh, meeting we've had. Uh, this is exactly what a forum should be, an exchange of high level information, an exchange of uh, uh, ideas uh, and ways forward. Um, Pierre, thank you for your great start to the meeting that really set the scene very well and specifically. Uh, and, uh, and I agree entirely with your uh, idea that we should expect the unexpected and, and we should be uh, ready to move on that. Uh, I had the honor of giving a talk at the Royal Belgian Academy a, a couple of years ago, and I thought I was gonna talk about my research on cell and molecular biology of macrophages and so on. And I was told, no, 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 talk about you, how you got to where you wanted to be. And it was very easy actually. And the answer is curiosity. We have to remain curious for innovation and be ready to see the unexpected and, and go for that. And the meeting today has really shown me uh, that if we can all do that, uh, this will be a really, really great way uh, forward. So remain curious. And one last thing, as uh, president of FIEMA, I was invited to Ursula van der Leyen's opening uh, address to the commission. Now, I'm sure all of you know that uh, she is a physician herself. She has had malignant disease in her family and is passionate about the treatment and research uh, in the field of cancer. So uh, as we say sometimes, we could be kicking against an open door. Uh, she is clearly wanting the commission and has said that research on cancer, its management, and uh, how to treat it uh, is one of the, if not the research uh, dominant uh, uh, thing in the commission's idea at the moment. And, and we heard from uh, Walter uh, at the beginning uh, from the cancer uh, commission that he is chair of, that, that he holds to that as well. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Elisa in the FEM office for pulling all of this together. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine, for uh, being very open and very uh, clear about uh, moderating. And thank you to all the panel who have been really, really stimulating and, uh, and helpful. I, I feel very encouraged uh, about this. So it's been a long morning, uh, but I, I've certainly uh, come, uh, come away feeling enthused and, uh, and thank you all very, very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Pierre. Bye, Welcome. thank you. Bye. Bye, thank Goodbye. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.